For thousands of years, baboons have been revered as wise and intelligent creatures. But in 21st century South Africa, they have become the primates that people love to hate. Hey! Hey! Close your door! Quickly! People hate baboons. Even nature conservation officials hate baboons. Leave the baboon alone. You have lost it. Seen as destructive pests, they are killed in their thousands. You shoot two, three, four a day. Tomorrow, there's two, three, four hundred more. The future of entire baboon populations is in jeopardy. But there is one extraordinary woman who is refusing to let this slaughter continue. I would say that I'm more likely to trust baboons than humans. Karen Sachs lives on the fringes of human society and has spent the last 10 years forming intimate relationships with these powerful and misunderstood primates. That's naughty, Scott. <laughs> Those primal urges of ours do exist. I think it's quite dangerous to deny that they exist. Now, for the first time, she has allowed the cameras in to film her remarkable life with these wild animals and her dramatic struggle to save the life of an orphaned baby baboon. I need to get in. I haven't got any pepper spray. The southern coastline of South Africa. A magnificent wilderness where the hills rise sharply from the sea, covered with impenetrable forest. It is in this dense woodland that Karen Sachs has chosen to live. For over a decade, Karen has lived intimately alongside the region's wild baboons. She knows these misunderstood primates better than anyone. Most of her time has been spent with one troop. She calls them the Gaia Troop, and has even learned how to talk to them. For people who don't know animals and don't understand nature, I think if they were to sit with a wild baboon troop for a day, it would change their perception. Baboons are genetically very similar to humans, sharing 91% of our DNA. They live in troops of up to 200 members and have complex social relationships. But despite these similarities, baboons and humans are in conflict. While baboons fear humans and never usually allow them to get this close. But Karen has earned their trust. Nice thing about baboons is they meet you once and they never forget you. <laughs> She's always, always, always with animals. She really knows what they're thinking. I don't know if it's a gift, I think it is. <laughs> it feels like being home. It's great, it really is. Karen lives in a remote cabin on the edge of the forest. When she isn't in a wild with baboons, she opens up her own home to orphaned and abandoned primates, offering them a sanctuary from the brutal conflict between man and ape. spending a lot of time with primates. Um, I felt that some lost part of the self had been unleashed. Uh, it was as if it was a part of the self that had been suppressed from birth. I call it the inner primate, um, and it's something that hasn't left me since then. Her sole human companion is her Canadian boyfriend, John. Living, living with Karen, is anything but normal. 
It really doesn't infringe on my life. You just got to readjust. Chicky, out the house. Come on, out the house. Karen and John have both decided not to have children. But she acts as a foster mother to 13 vervet monkeys and one orphaned baby baboon. You can't go out of their sight because they really need to see the mother constantly. You just go to the bathroom or something, they'll scream with separation anxiety. This is Camus. He was brought to me about three days ago. His mother had been shot and then beaten to death with a spade. So he's been through quite a bit of trauma. Me putting him down or he's feeling like I'm rejecting him and um, it's quite a traumatic process for them to go through. It's got to be a gradual thing. Yeah, that's what happens. It's a, okay, well he found the bottle as a substitute. It's very much a mother-child bond, and yet, deep down, I just have never had a maternal instinct. I can't relate to women who have human babies because they see my relationship with, you know, my foster babies, the animals in my care, as different. It's trivialized and it's undermined. Karen has spent months at a time in the wild observing baboons with minimal human contact. Once I started getting back into human society, I realized for the first time just how far away from human society I'd gone. <laughs> it's four o'clock in the morning and Karen has just received a distress call. A two-year-old baboon has been abandoned by its troop and left to die in the forest. He's struggling to breathe. His condition could be caused by a respiratory infection or tuberculosis, but it may also be something more sinister. This traumatized animal's life is hanging in the balance, and Karen is his only chance of survival. Karen Sachs has spent the last 10 years learning how to get close to unpredictable wild baboons. This proximity has given her a rare opportunity to decode their language. First of all, I'll approach them very slowly. I'll approach them sidewards almost. If they start getting nervous, I'll immediately sit down. I'll look the other way. And I sometimes use a comfort grunt. Another friendly gesture is the lip smack, which is... That is a kind of... Hello, it's when you want to call someone over to come to you. Another one is the where are you bark. <coughs> um, those baboons that know me well, they, they've often responded. <coughs> the more that they can see that I'm passive and I'm not there to hurt them, the closer they allow me to get to them. Mikshmu. Karen's obsessive interest in baboons dates back to her early childhood. I used to call my mother in every night to leave the light on and tell her I was, you know, that there were baboons all over my dreams and it was rather disconcerting. You know, they would just be sitting around, just so many of them, um, just looking at me with this incredible wisdom in their eyes. Um, and it was, it was as if they, they looked very human. Growing up in suburban Pretoria, Karen's parents hoped she might become a lawyer or a doctor. But Karen always felt that she was different and that this version of normal was not for her. 
She's always been strange, actually. <laughs> so I don't. Yeah, I'm, I mean, if I think intellectually, I think the same about you. <laughs> <'Cause> I'm normal. <laughs> You're so normal. I'm normal. <laughs> like I have children, and I got. And but you she's, got married. Yeah, and, yeah, she talks to like she used to have cats. She used to like she used to talk to her cats. You know, it's like in this funny cat language. Since she's small, she could take a hook out of a fish. I could. I would run away. <laughs> yeah. Can I tell about Louis Shapiro? The story that they were. I don't have. remember any of these <laughs> stories. So go for it. It's the first okay. time I'm hearing. Well, this. in Pretoria, the biggest divorce lawyer. And I mean, he is renowned. He did. He does famous people's divorce or whatever. But it was a family friend, and she went to him, and she walked into his office and with a baboon, you know, into this this man's office. I don't know what he did or what he said, but that story goes around, family and friends and really? everyone. Don't you remember? I remember it, oh. but I didn't know. I mean, oh I yes. Yeah. Where do you think I, I got this from? I didn't get it from you. Yeah, I do very often feel misunderstood and judged for what I do. Um, you know, you, if you choose to live in the wild with animals and you choose to not hang out with people that much, it's a bit, it is eccentric. And I just want to be true to myself. I don't want to follow anybody else's guidelines for how I should be. It's the morning after the sick baboon arrived at Karen's house. He knows what's going on here. He's still struggling to breathe and needs urgent medical attention. It's very, very unusual for a baboon to be alone. And it looks like he's very weak and has probably been trying to keep up to the troop for a few days. Um, I'm sure the troop members that are close to him probably tried to you know, help him for as long as they can and until they were forced to give up. That's especially when he's sleeping. During the birthing season from November to January, Karen receives many calls asking her to look after an abandoned or wounded primate. And he doesn't have a cough. This baby is just one of hundreds caught up in this tragic conflict. And last, magically, we have a, a weight of four and a half. Come on, boy. Come on. If um, he does start coughing and mm. actual snotty mucus produced outside his nose and coughing up lumps of phlegm, then we must you know, sedate him and collect yeah. some of that in central culture just to get a positive okay. diagnosis. A week later, the orphan is cleared of TB and is starting to show signs of recovery. Karen feels ready to give him a name. I had a whole list of names that I was going through and as I was reading this name, Kajika, which means to walk in silence, he came wandering around the door, totally silent, you know, <laughs> tiptoeing along on the carpet. And uh, that just stood out to me that his name has to be Kajika. Over the past 10 years, Karen has been testing new methods of baboon rehabilitation. She intends to release Kajika into a wild troop, but it is a risky and dangerous process, as the plight of wild baboons is getting more and more desperate. South Africa is one of the few remaining countries in the world where wild animals still roam free. This rich heritage has been respected by the indigenous people for thousands of years. Baboons were highly regarded and still are. For example, every tribe has, it, has its totem. So a whole clan of people, their totem might be the baboon. The baboon is seen as a very wise animal. The indigenous sand people look to them for knowledge about the local environment. The Bobbyana had a mate there, the Bobbyana, for you, the medicine of Wees. And the Bergen had a great deal of Bobbyana, and the Bobbyana had a great deal of Bobbyana. And then the Oma, the Bobbyana, 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 the Bobb
Dus medicijnen daar. Zo het ons die medicijnen geleerd kunnen. Daarom kunnen we ons bij je medicijnen in die karoo. As man encroaches further and further into the baboon's living space, the fight for land becomes a matter of human livelihood or animal death. The baboons are targeted as pests and are frequently shot at, maimed and killed. A lot of people just shoot just because a baboon is in their house um, and they don't know how to handle the situation. People are inclined to panic um, because of what they don't know. I think where we go wrong a lot of the time in wildlife is not enough behavioural work is being done. So we don't know the animal. And we've got to go out of our way to not only obviously protect species, but we've got to, we've got to look after individuals of a species as well. And Karen is like one of the early pioneers of this sort of work. There are people who admire Karen's work with baboons, but there are many more who don't. Baboon matters who stand between the residents and the baboons tell you you shouldn't open your doors and windows and you shouldn't grow any vegetables in your garden and you shouldn't grow any fruit trees um, and you've got to be vigilant. You know, it, the problem is that eventually you get to a situation where you feel you might as well move away and stay in a prison. This is basically where they live up in the mountains over here and uh, they'll come down and then over the fence here and uh, they'll run along a wall like this. And they're extremely agile. They head for areas where there's food. So, I mean, the, those bananas over there, they'd disappear immediately if they got into the house. Yeah. They, they can actually open the fridge. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Open the microwave, they'll open all the cupboards. You can't find the police. Um, they're not going to arrest them and throw them in jail, so it, it's, it really is um, very difficult. Open my beer fridge too, but they didn't have any of my beers. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I think it's just a matter of time when they learn how to open a beer too, and then they're in big trouble. <laughs> when you live next to wild animals, it requires some compromises, but that's, you know, that's part of living in the wild. You know, we just, we need to think about what we're doing to attract wildlife onto our properties and um, act in a more responsible way. The more interaction there is between humans and baboons, the greater the conflict, which baboon researcher Justin Orion knows only too well. Excuse me! Oi! Hey! Close your door! Quickly! No, 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 don't aggress the baboon. Okay, no, leave him. Leave the baboon alone. You have lost it. Okay. Lock your car. Okay, wait, 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 wait. You, you have baboons that are free to move across a range of lands. So they go from, from national park onto city and onto private. And in, in the process of doing so, there are no one and everyone's responsibility. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Look, just These baboons have become desensitized to humans. They no longer respect the boundaries between themselves and people. Ah, no. No, uh, okay, just, just leave it. Just calm and leave it. A few biscuits provides more nutrition than a whole afternoon of foraging. They, they need to have someone permanently with this trip because this is every single day of every single... of the holiday season, there's a scenario like this going on. Okay. Thank you. Oh, he's in again. You didn't lock, eh? Oh, no. You didn't lock. People just sim simply say, well, look, look at all the mountains. Why on earth do they have to come down here when they've got all that mountain? It's, it's simple. Why don't you go and farm up there? Oh, you can't. Well, nor can they eat up there. You can't build houses up there either. So we just don't seem to want to share any of the low-lying land, which is a pity. That's what we need to get right. The struggle for territory between man and baboon is a conflict with an increasing number of casualties. Each one potentially another emergency call for Karen, another baboon in need of help. This time the location means it could be a baboon 
from Karen's beloved Gaia troop. I've just arrived and I've just heard some awful news. They found a adult male baboon dying along this path. Fear of seeing somebody I know well dead was just too much. There Mickey is. <laughs> Karen's worst fears are confirmed. Patty, a baboon she has known for years, is found dead. There are these strange bruise marks which could be poisoning. What do you do with that? I'm going to take it with me. I just put it in a sacred place. I have a very, very, very strong feeling that I want to stop the harm, no matter what. Um, knowing that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of baboons are being shot for pine plantations or some crop, um, it's, it's unbearable to even think about, you know, to really think about. Karen Sachs lives alongside wild baboons. Mm, 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 mm. She observes their behavior fosters their young and is passionate about their protection. Yeah, yeah. Can I come sit next to you? Hmm? But even those who admire her question whether she sometimes gets too close. I don't agree with baboons and humans touching. And, and the reason why I don't agree with that is because we have viruses, bacteria, that we can pass on to them. Well, I think the distance should be maintained. That's first and foremost. But thereafter, if in the cases of, you know, if you had to bottle feed and you do break that barrier, that baboon will not associate every human with, oh, you're going to feed me with a bottle. It's, it, it's just, that's, it, you couldn't be more wrong if you had that stance. <laughs> John, who lives and breathes Karen's work, believes that she is unique. And without her, these animals would have nowhere to go. What she's doing is, is, is amazing. I mean, more people should stand up. The animals need a voice, and if she's going to speak, then let, him, let, let her speak. Karen's intimate one-on-one -on -one approach is controversial, but it seems to be working. Kajika, the abandoned baby baboon, is getting stronger. A month after he came into her care, she is ready to let him go outside for the first time. Yeah. A vital step on his path to rehabilitation. It's nice outside. He's obviously really enjoying being groomed and it's just what he needs. He's lip smacking at her. She understands that. She lip smacks as well. <laughs> the monkeys are a comfort, but they are no replacement for living with other baboons. Ah! That was a where are you bark, but um, the monkeys all just ducked. <laughs> He looks lonely, you know, he's, he's missing home. <laughs> Karen's hope is to integrate Kajuka with the wild Gaia troop. 
She has only ever successfully managed this twice before. Wild troops are unpredictable and can be dangerous. Despite the risks, Karen is pressing ahead with her plan to introduce Kajika to the wild troop for the first time. Just in the event Kajika screams and the baboons come to his defense, we just need to be protected. So John has made a very, very strong cage. Karen's fears stem from hard experience. Last year, one of her foster babies called Karma was attacked by a wild baboon. I was living on a farm in the Mkhalisburg and I had five baby baboons in my care. And um, for about a month I would hear the, the dog go off and bark in the bushes and I always felt someone's there, you know. An alpha male baboon from a neighboring troop had been hanging around the boundary of her farm. One blistering summer's afternoon, Karin left baby Karma with a friend in order to buy provisions. She said, Kaz, just go. Just trust me for once. Um, I'll get her in. As soon as you go, I'll wait. I'll look after her. And I got a call on my cell and it was my friend and she was shivering and whimpering on the phone and saying, he's here, Phallus is here. And I said, where's Karma? And she said, Karma is outside as well. He's trying to get her. I said, Estelle, I'm coming back right now. Just shoot out the window. We went and we searched and eventually the dog Tao found Karma who, who was alive but punctured from head to toe with these deep wounds. Um, he committed infanticide. It's, it's that feeling that I was the protector, I failed, the guilt involved in it. You know, what could I have done to avoid it? That plagues you and just knowing that you weren't there to stop that from happening when these little helpless beings are completely reliant on you. Infanticide is when the alpha male kills a baby baboon who is not related to him, ensuring the survival of his own bloodline. I've seen in centuries where people are too scared to even put um, a single primate with a troop because they're fighting and they're scared they're going to get killed. And I think, you know, I do take those kind of risks, but the more I see, admittedly, the more fears I have and the harder it gets. The day has come for orphan Kajika to meet a troop of wild baboons for the first time since he was abandoned. When she does release this one, when Karen releases this one, it'll bring a smile to my face. Something was done right. I know, love, but he gets scared. He's supposed to see me through so that I can comfort him while we... He, he, otherwise, he's all alone. Get in. It all came together for me was when I rehabilitated a baby baboon called Gizmo into a troop that were wild. The plan was to sit in an enclosure and I did that all day and I watched each individual work out a relationship with Gizmo. They basically, they led the rehabilitation process and as a result it was 100% successful. Those baboons changed my life and they changed the direction I wanted to take my life. Although Karen trusts the process, she knows that Kajika's life is still potentially under threat from the most powerful male in the troop, the alpha male, Shaka.
Primates take a very, very long time to bond with each other. If I were to just drop him off, it would be very dangerous. Um, there's a chance of infanticide. After Karen and Kajika wait patiently for an hour, Shaka makes his first appearance. Mm -hmm. Once he's checked out the scene, the rest of his troop emerge from the forest. Confident that all is well, Karen leaves the cage and lets the introduction begin. Within minutes, the Gaia troop are swarming all over the cage. Kajika's cry alerts a young baboon. He alerts the rest of the troop to Kajika's presence, and the panic spreads. I need to get in. I haven't got any pepper spray. Karen immediately climbs back in. OK, somebody just warned everyone that we have a baboon in here. The alpha male himself posed no threat, but the drama reaffirms Karen's fears. <laughs> Since her scare, Karen is feeling protective over Kajika. She is still worried about his breathing. New results have come in from the vet. She said that he has permanent lung damage um, and she also said she would find a sanctuary for him and not release him back into the wild if she was me. Nobody seems to know what he really suffered from, whether it was pesticide poisoning or whether it was pneumonia, whether he was born with a lung defect. No one really knows what the truth is. For the moment, Kajika is staying safely with Karen. Bob! Under Karen's constant care, Kajika has grown into a boisterous, energetic teenager. His weight has increased, his chest is much healthier, and she is finding it difficult to keep up with his antics. <laughs> this is part of what it means to be a young baboon's playmate, you know. Have your hair pulled up. <laughs> This is rough play. It's, you know, it's just how baboons are. If you want to call it, when you make a choice to get close to baboons, it is your choice to allow them to touch you. But in this case, I choose to let Kajika get close to me. Uh, once you do that, the baboon treats you like you'll treat another baboon. He's getting quite heavy to throw around these days. You need a baby baboon. A few days later, Karen is in the garden when the monkeys start to sound their alarm call. <laughs> well, monkeys up there warning. Which are they looking in that direction? No, she's she, she's looking that way. Yeah. What do you think they've seen? I'm not sure they're warning and we did hear we did hear a baboon barking over there 
But they're looking in that direction. And hopefully whoever it is will come out of the trees. Incredibly, a troop of wild baboons have turned up at the house. They're paying Kajika a lot of attention. Karen doesn't know this troop and is worried what they might do to Kajika. So she's keeping him safe in the enclosure. Um, I just went up and saw a baboon on the roof. Let's see. It would be dangerous to let Kajika out at the moment. Despite the possible dangers, Kajika is fascinated by these unexpected visitors. Definitely seems much more um, talkative and curious. Have you seen them? Could Karen have found a way for Kajika to return to the wild with his own kind? Every day for four months, a troop of wild baboons has been visiting Karen's house. She's been cautious about letting them get too close, but allows the orphan Kajika to observe them from a safe distance. Safe or not, a relationship is growing between Kajika and the wild baboons. You know, initially, I'd see Kajika going really close to them and get a little, I was a bit nervous um, because, you know, he was like, you've got one of our kind and they were, they were protective towards him. He's actually um, saying, come here, when you do that, let's come here. The indirect kind of body language that they're showing each other is typical of baboons. That this is how baboons get closer to each other. I wasn't trying to do this, you know what I mean? <laughs> Someone else was doing it. This is quite incredible how close these two baboons are. There's something happening here that wasn't ever planned. For Karen, these are extraordinary moments. If Kajika can be successfully integrated with these wild baboons, she could have a local troop into which she can place other orphans. He's been giving the where are you bark, and he's, yeah, it definitely makes him really happy. And all 40 of them were here, so I was, I, I was a little bit nervous when the whole troop's here. Karen is facing a dilemma over whether or not to release Kajika. She has observed that a number of the troop have disappeared or have been wounded. This is a dangerous area for baboons, and the last thing she wants is for Kajika to be shot by a local farmer. I've seen males coming in, in, into this troop and disappearing so soon afterwards. Um, I haven't actually seen them being shot, but I know that's what's happening. Around here, you're allowed to shoot baboons and monkeys. Down about six o'clock when the sun's high already, you see them come out the bush, out the trees, and then you see them everywhere. They sit and they sit and they wait and they sit in the sun, and then they're all over the shop. If I take my vehicle and I leave, then they just raid this house. They're everywhere, I'm telling you, they're everywhere. They, they're hundreds. I'll tell you how many I've killed. I mean, maybe I will come in trouble, but they plenty. I was so cross, I went in, I took the rifle, because they were around, and I start shooting. If you shoot the top males in a troop who are raiding your house, what happens is it just makes space for new males to move in. You shoot two, three, four a day. Tomorrow, there's two, three, four hundred more. Well, why carry on shooting if it's not working? You know, if that's his argument. Um... 
as they tell you, but you two know their behavior, you two study their behavior. I don't, I'm not a monkey, why am I to study their behavior? That's why I feel so despairing about it. It's not as if this monkey's life is so cheap that you can just shoot them out of anger and it's not even a solution to you. Karen has spent 10 months developing a close relationship with this vulnerable baboon. She's nurtured Kajika back to good health, but now she's facing one of the most difficult decisions of her life. Is she willing to expose him to the danger of being returned to the wild? Honestly, with Kajika, there's nothing more that I want than for him to be free and wild, and I'm really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever begin to stop that process. His welfare means a huge amount to me, but I couldn't cope with another loss. I do protect myself against that. Mm. You talk about letting him go, but there's something inside of you, emotionally, that won't let him go. Yes, admittedly, there's... My fears control me sometimes. Um, Polly, well, that's why I didn't have children. I would keep them in cages. I promise. I'm an overprotective Leo. I'd probably... I really think I'd control my children too much. I mean, look, I, I don't know. I haven't gone through it, but I don't think I'd be a good mother to humans. I'd be terrified. I'd be up all night. You know, I'd probably be keeping them back from living. It's really, I suppose, that you just don't see the world as safe. Mm -mm. That's the issue, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's... The thing is, it's not safe. <laughs> Despite Karen's fears of what may happen to Gajika, She's coming to the conclusion that this decision may already be out of her hands. Nature is taking over. Actually, what is happening here is <laughs> Kajika is already going through rehabilitation and has been for the last four months with this troop. So I don't have a choice anymore. I can't go and say to Kajika, you've got to come back now. Um, you know, you're not allowed to move into this troop. To be honest with you, I don't have that choice. I'd, once a baboon moves into a troop, he's with them, and he would be showing allegiance with them, not with me. I'm almost 100% sure that if I let this process continue, Kajika, he'll go into this troop and make all the friends he needs to make, and it'll be totally successful in time, you know? Karen Sachs has dedicated her life to protecting the animals she loves. But while there are more people intent on murdering the primates of South Africa than nurturing them, hers will be a lonely struggle. You feel defeated on so many levels because the problem is so big. But nobody gives up. You can't give up. Um, that just wouldn't make sense to do that. I never, ever stop learning about baboons. Um, it's like this ongoing soap opera that I, I find it eternally fascinating. I, can, I never, ever get bored watching baboons or being with them. Um, I think they've got a lot to teach me still. And I don't think that's ever going to stop. What an absolutely amazing lady. Next tonight on Five, the witnesses are not your average kind in Vegas, but just how much can you learn from a traumatised tortoise? Find out in New CSI in just a sec. <laughs>